winds through West Wiltshire, the canal threads its way between Milksham and Trowbridge. And here at Hilperton, they're constructing one of the new marinas that'll accommodate the rapidly increasing traffic on the waterway. There'll be essential facilities, and already there are long waiting lists for moorings in them. But this suggests that one of the charms of the canal, its tranquility, might disappear forever. Well, I've been invited on board the Wyvern, a hire boat that's based at Hilperton. And its owner, Graham Lee, is anxious that the number of boats using the canal should be carefully monitored. Too many of them, and there'll be less pleasure for everybody. For Graham, working on the canal is a satisfying way of life. And the Sleeping Beauty, as it was often called before its reawakening, has an almost romantic attraction for him and many others. You can't help but fall in love with it and become enthusiastic. There's a village community along the canal and they'll all feel the same because they're involved with it day in and day out. It's not like a lorry driver where you're going up the M4 getting sworn at by a passing motorist. This is totally laid back, four miles an hour, relax and just let things happen around you. It's vibrant in its beauty. It's... Pirate laureates would have a great time down here. I'm struggling for words, but I feel it in here. And I'm sure you felt the magic of the canal. Today, when the aim is to popularize the canal, to encourage peaceful pursuits of all kinds on this long, narrow water park, it's all too easy to forget that it was originally very much a commercial undertaking. It was built and run by a company that needed to make profit for its shareholders. And that's what it did, until Brunel opened his Great Western Railway linking London and Bristol in 1841. By 1852, the competition had become so great that the canal company sold out to its rival, the GWR. The railwaymen, not unnaturally, made great efforts not to promote the waterway. And so, inevitably, it went into a steady decline. Well, we've now reached the wharf at Bradford-on-Avon. And, still on the financial theme, there's a reminder here of how the canal made its money. Tolls were charged depending on the weight of a cargo and the distance that the vessel had to travel. It usually worked out at about a penny a ton a mile. But of course it was totally impractical to say to the man on the boat, unload your cargo onto the dockside and let's weigh it. So they worked out a very simple but ingenious method of measuring the cargo and they did it using this gauge. Now what would happen is that once a boat was finished it would be fitted out but not filled with any cargo and brought here to the dry dock at Bradford on Avon which was used as a way dock. Now it would come in and if you look around the dock side here you can see there are lots of stones that have rings in the top. Now these were used as weights and what they would do is load on the stones a ton at a time and with each ton they would get out this measuring gauge which is just a, a hollow pipe which has a piece of uh, measuring stick inside it attached to a float. Now if you pop this into the water you'll see that the float pushes up the wood there and they would take a measurement at four points on the boat two aft and two at the front take an average of that and enter it into a log they would then add another ton of stone take another measurement at four points and so on right the way up to about 40 ton for the boats and about 60 ton for the barges and uh, once they'd got that complete log it was all entered in a ledger like this one and we can see here that uh, here was a boat called the Barge Perseverance in 1896. That one went up to uh, 55 tons. And that copy of that log was then sent to every toll station along the canal. And all that would happen is that when the boat came into the toll station, they would get out their measuring stick, compare the measurement with this log, and they would know exactly how much toll they had to charge for the weight being carried. Simple, really. It was here at Bradford-on-Avon that a newsworthy launch took place in 1969, and it was a memorable occasion. 
I name this craft Moonrake. May God bless all who work her. <laughs> the young lady who had the honor of performing the ceremony might just prefer to forget all about it. More fun and enjoyment from getting happiness. Oh, I've done everything! <laughs> 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 Now, although it may look like it, Heath Robinson, in fact, had nothing to do with the moonrake. She was the work of three local schools, and she was designed to clear this part of the canal from weed, the arch enemy of the propeller-driven boat. And she worked on very simple principles. A dredge at the front scooped up the weed, which was then raked off by the crew. Paddles meant that she could easily be turned round in the narrow canal and accurately steered towards offending clumps of weed. She carried out her task for several years and was eventually broken up, but she's now part of the canal's folklore. Bradford-on-Avon is a small town with a long history. It grew up in Saxon times around a river crossing, a broad ford, and today the focus of the town is still the main bridge across the river. It was built in the 17th century, but incorporated parts of a medieval bridge, two arches, and a little pilgrim's chapel, which was converted into a lock-up for drunks and troublemakers. For centuries, Bradford was a centre of the cloth weaving industry, and apart from some fine old mill buildings, there are a number of handsome private residences that were built with the profits from the cloth trade. But some of the most important architecture is ecclesiastical, the Saxon church is a gem. Certainly a thousand years old, some experts believe it could even date back to the year 700. And there's a magnificent tithe barn. Built in the early 14th century, it's one of the biggest in England. In 1848, Stephen Moulton purchased an empty mill in Bradford and started to manufacture articles made of rubber. His business flourished and there's still a big rubber factory here today. But it was a descendant of his, Dr. Alex Moulton, who became the town's most famous son when he invented a revolutionary small-wheeled bicycle in the early 1960s. At one time, the bicycles were mass-produced, but now he only turns out handmade models at the very top end of the market. However, they're still all fitted with his special suspension system, and they've still all got those distinctive small wheels. Well, outside his quite magnificent home, Dr. Moulton has put some of his models on display for me. And I'm interested to know just how he first came up with this breakthrough in design. Taking an ordinary bicycle, which I found very wonderful, and saying, well, this beautiful thing, can't I improve it? And one of the first things I studied was uh, whether anything could be obviously altered. And the thing that I found entirely good is riding position and the components and the seat and handlebars, but the thing that was wrong, in my view, was the size of wheels. So having uh, dis discovered that, and we did some tests with high-pressure tyres so that they would ro roll easily, and added suspension so they'd be more comfortable, and made an open frame, and that essentially was, was the invention of the Moulton bicycle, early examples of which one can see down here. And that was the first one back in 1962, and then they come forward with the safari, which is meant for the longest distance riding. And then rather a smart, snazzy one there, which is the first of the separating bicycle, which we call the stowaway. So you could actually divide that divide one up that and two. put exactly. it in the boot? Put it in the boot. So that was the first generation of mountain bicycles. And the one next to it with the drop this handlebars. One, right. Now this then, there's a big gap in, in the history between those and this one. And you will see how different the frame is. Mm. This time the frame, it looks rather complicated small tubes, but they're there for a purpose. The difference in weight between that, which is our current bicycle, the M14, and the earlier one, is something like 10 pounds. Now, 10 pounds in a bicycle is a tremendous lot. It's next door neighbor, the one that we're looking at here, is the Jubilee. Uh, I called it the Jubilee because I introduced it when we'd been at this game off and on for 25 years. And on this one, we can see this, right, this unique see, suspension. Indeed. That's right. If, if you like to look down there, you can see, as I move it on the handlebars, you can see the movement of what we call the leading link suspension. And in the rear half, you see the, the rear suspension, which if I press it up and down, you can see the front and rear, we're looking at the rear now, moving under the action of the rider's weight and the road underneath it. 
And, and that makes it comfortable to ride, doesn't it? It makes it? an entirely different thing to an ordinary bicycle. <laughs> Every year during the first weekend in September, canal boats of all shapes and sizes, together with their suitably attired owners, assemble for the Bradford on Avon Wharf Show. The highlight is the parade of boats when turnout and handling skills are judged and various trophies awarded. It's thoroughly enjoyed by everyone who takes part, whether they win anything or not. And for the large crowd that always comes to watch, it's a lively and fascinating affair. The Wharf Show has now been a regular event for 14 years, and so it's established itself in the Canal World's calendar. But it's also been a wonderful fundraiser for the Kennet and Avon Canal Trust, as it makes a profit of about £10,000 for them every year. What helps to make it so particularly colourful is the canal boat art that adorns most of the bits and pieces on the roofs of the boats. It's very bright, very bold and very traditional. One artist who specialises in this form of painted decoration is Elaine Lavender, who lives and works right next to the canal at Avoncliff, which is just west of Bradford. The shelves of Elaine's shop are filled with items that she's painted in the style that's unique to canal boats. But where did the style come from? And why do roses and exotic castles predominate? Well, there are a number of theories to choose from. My favourite one is that they copied what was very popular at the time on furniture. If you think of the Victorian furniture, it's very often black lacquered with pictures of, of castles and flowery scenes on it. It's um, very often happens people copy things and it spreads all around the country. Theirs was, of course, a very more primitive form than was seen on the furniture because they did it themselves. It's very much the art of the people then. Oh, yes, very much. And they're not castles like the sort that you would expect to see anywhere no, in England or no, Great Britain, are they? they're very foreign. In actual fact, they are most similar to uh, Germanic folk art. And uh, they're, they're, they're similar in look to French castles and castles on the continent. This is one, one of the reasons I say they must have seen them from popular furniture or advertising, this sort of thing, of the time, because they weren't the sort of people that would have been wi widely read or travelled. So it must have come some, from something that was very obvious. What about the colours? Because they're quite traditional too, aren't they? The colours are always the same. It's always the, the red, yellow and white roses with the little white daisies. If it's not those colours, it's not canal boat painting. How do you build up the roses? Because they're, they're not sort of just straight roses. They're very stylised, aren't they? That's right. You can see from here, it's a, a circle, a basic circle at the back and, and your leaves, at which you put the, pa the petals on top. And it's a very basic formula, once you've learnt it and got the hang of it, it's quite straightforward. The backgrounds on these are dry, so you can have a go, and if, it, if you don't like it, we can easily wipe it off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right. So which ones am I going to have a go like, If you do a yellow one, that's on mm -hmm. an orange background there, yeah. you can see. Have I got one to copy, so I know what I'm supposed to be doing? I, should, I think there's one that's done next All to right. it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do it. that. That. Well, that's all right. Not right quite as good idea. as yours, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Avon Cliff Aqueduct carries the canal across the River Avon, which now begins to flow through a narrow valley. It was superbly designed in the classical style by John Rennie, the canal's engineer. But it wasn't long before it became obvious that the bath stone used in its construction wasn't of very good quality. Although it never actually proved to be unsafe, Clever modern restoration techniques mean that everyone can now cross it with perfect peace of mind. And I'm now doing just that in the Ladywood, 
which regularly makes trips along the next delightful section of the canal. Like all the other Kennet and Avon Canal Trust boats, the Ladywood is run by volunteers, and the money she raises from taking passengers on cruises goes towards improving the waterway. The Ladywood will have a special place in the canal's history. She'll have the honor of being the first boat to use the Cane Hill flight of locks when they were officially opened by Her Majesty the Queen. This part of the canal is known as the Nine Mile Pound, as there isn't a single lock on the stretch of canal between Bradford-on-Avon and Bath. And we're now approaching what's acknowledged to be one of John Rennie's greatest architectural achievements, another aqueduct over the Avon. This one is at Limpley Stoke. 150 feet long, it was built of somewhat better quality bath stone than the one at Avoncliff, so it survived in a slightly healthier condition. Its symmetry was lost, however, when an extra arch was added for a railway line in 1857. It was called the Dundas Aqueduct in honor of Charles Dundas, the first chairman of the canal company. The whole canal has been rescued thanks to the two and a half million pounds raised by the Kennet and Avon Canal Trust since it began in 1962. But for Admiral Sir William O'Brien, who's been chairman since 1974, it hasn't all been plain sailing. I do admit to being bothered at times that I was raising money and wasn't really being quite honest with the people who were giving it to me because I didn't in my heart believe that we'd ever raise enough to do the whole job. It was a question of raising money, but also presumably keeping people's enthusiasm because you depended a great deal on your volunteers, didn't you? Yes, indeed. Uh, and it, as a management exercise, it was really rather interesting because you've got 86 miles of canal, but only about 40 yards wide. A long, long length, and everybody interested in their own patch. People are parochial, so it was difficult to start with, keeping Reading happy when you were spending money in Bath and vice versa. <laughs> How important were your volunteers to you? What sort of work did they do? Uh, they were extremely important in, in, initially, not so much in the work they could do, because the amount you can do every other weekend coming down isn't very much. It wasn't so that's that, it was that the public saw that we were that we were putting ewes in the bottom of the canal, that we were doing something worthwhile, and we rattled our boxes and they filled them. What really then was the turning point in the history of the Trust? Oh, it's right here behind us, in fact, before the dry section, as it's called, which is a two-mile stretch from Limpley Stoke here at, at, uh, to Avoncliff. Uh, that dry section had been dry for many years, it's over, it's fissured limestone and the water simply ran out through the limestone. And so it's all been concreted, a most complicated and enormous engineering op operation in which we pledged two years income in one year, money we hadn't got to do. And that was the turning point. After that, people who doubted us before began to believe that we would finish the job. Just next to the Dundas Aqueduct is the entrance to what used to be the Somerset Coal Canal. Opened in 1805 and abandoned exactly a hundred years later, the first quarter of a mile or so has now been turned into a marina. Though it was separately owned, it was built as a branch of the Kennet and Avon, and John Rennie carried out the surveys and made the plans for it. It ran for 10 miles, mainly along the Midford Valley, into the heart of the Somerset Coalfield. It provided the Kennet and Avon with a lot of business, 
because the vast amount of coal that came out of it had to be transported along the bigger canal to its destination. It was only half the width of the Kennet and Avon, but that didn't make its building any easier. At Coombe Hay, for example, 22 locks were eventually built to overcome a rise of 138 feet. Before that, though, they'd tried an inclined plane. This slope is all that's left of that. And for a short while earlier still, they'd experimented with a thing called a caisson lock. Tim Wheldon, who owns the marina and has done quite a lot of research into the history of the canal, explains just why it's most famous for this curious lock. The caisson lock was an extraordinary contraption, unique to the Somerset Coal Canal. Um, it's very difficult to describe it because it's so unbelievable. It was an enormous well, uh, a bit like a glorified enlarged lock, which was always full of water, in which floated a chamber, a sort of rectangular box, in which in turn floated the boat. So the boat would sail in the top level through a system of watertight doors, which would then be closed. More water would be added to the chamber, which would then sink like a submarine into the lock, into the, the caisson. At the bottom level, a series of watertight doors would open again and it would sail out at the lower level. This would be complete with crew. So the whole boat was sort of entombed in this metal box? It was. I think the box was actually wooden, even more extraordinary. <laughs> Did they ever lose anybody? No, uh, they didn't, amazingly enough, because the thing, although it worked, uh, it wasn't a tremendous success. Basically, the, the ideas were ahead of the technology. They just didn't have the, the machinery, the materials to actually make it work. Well, even though they don't seem to have been too well organised where this section of the canal was concerned, they were actually a very profitable company, weren't they? The Somerset Coal Canal was, yes, yes, it, it was. They, it really did very well indeed. It shifted an enormous amount of tonnage of coal and uh, was the main lifeblood of the network of canals across southern England. Uh, it, it actually paid a dividend, uh, a healthy dividend to its shareholders, and it didn't stop making a profit until 1890, which was very late in the canal age. This is the very latest thing in hire boats on the canal, a battery-driven boat. It's marvellous. It's extremely easy to drive, and the almost silent running makes a trip on the canal a very soothing experience. of being on a canal is that there are no outside pressures or distractions to stop you from enjoying the reflections in the water or meditating on the occasional wider scenes that unexpectedly present themselves above the towpath. And it's really curious how one's perspectives change. Somehow, even just going under a bridge becomes a major event. wasn't solely used by the large, slow-moving vessels that carried the bulk cargoes. There were quite a few small, fast boats on the canal as well. They were called fly boats, and they were designed to carry a maximum of 15 tons of cargo, or passengers, or both. Now, they were taken along the towpath by at least two horses that galloped on at between eight and nine miles an hour, and every few miles or so, they'd be changed at a relay station. And those flyboats used to keep going day and night until they reached their destination. And the advantage was that every other vessel on the canal had to give them right away. They even had to drop their own tow ropes into the canal so that they could pass on by. 
Now, this extraordinary sort of Pony Express on the canals could obviously do the journey very quickly. So whereas the large barges and boats would take anything up to an average of 81 hours to travel from Newbury to Bath, flyboats could do the same journey in 36 hours. Well, this great outpouring of water means that we've arrived at Claverton, where the water level in the Nine Mile Pound is kept topped up. The water comes from the River Avon, 47 feet below, and to raise it, Rennie employed a method that's unique on British canals, no doubt inspired by the corn mill that the Claverton pumping station replaced. It was a water wheel. When the sluice is opened, water rushes in from the leet outside to turn the wheel. And what a massive wheel it is. It's 17 and a half feet in diameter, 24 feet wide, and it weighs 20 tons. And of course, the clever thing about it all is that it's the river itself that provides the power to pump its own water up the hillside. It began work in 1813, three years after the canal was opened and it remained in operation for around 140 years. Then, in 1952, a vast amount of damage was caused by a floating log. It took 11,500 man-hours of restoration work by students from Bath University and members of the Canal Trust to get it back into working order. But now, electric pumps have been installed, and the wheel is only set in motion at certain times so that the public can come in and see it in all its working glory. This place is like heaven on earth for engineers and industrial archaeologists. In fact, anyone who likes watching a real machine at work. With the water wheel set to rotate at its normal working rate of five revolutions a minute, the pumps raise 98,000 gallons of water an hour from the river and deliver them into the canal. Yet another problem solved by the imaginative talent of the canal's creator, John Rennie. And so it's on towards Bath, the River Avon, and Bristol, which we'll be exploring next week when we complete our journey along this historic and enchanting canal.